Okay, this is, uh, this is for some of us older folks, this question. So how many of you at some point in your life had one of those big green covered living Bibles? Kind of a cushy cover. Yeah, a lot of us. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I lost mine along the way because I think both covers fell off of it. And then I shifted to the New American Standard, uh, which is the one that Peter and Paul carried. So that made me more spiritual. And, uh, but that, I have, and I hadn't had one until my mom and dad were downsizing and okay, we don't need all this stuff and all, everything on these shelves. And dad had a, had his green living Bible that uh, he had carried during the, most of the 70s. And so it's up in my study now and uh, very special to me. I've done my Bible reading when I read through the Bible in a year. I'm doing study in some places and I'm reading for just for what God wants to say to me on any given day from a variety of translations. And I read through the Living Bible again uh, about three years ago in my daily Bible reading. And there's certain verses and certain translations that just really jump off the page to me in certain, certain versions. And one of my favorite way, verses rendered in the Living Bible comes from Ephesians. And this is what it says, Ephesians 1.5. This is how the Living Bible does it. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. And he did this because he wanted to. Now, God's plan has not changed. Last week, we we looked at a story uh, uh, from Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve. That's way back when, Adam and Eve. And what we found is that they sinned and God brought punishment to them because of their sin. Now, here's what we got to know. Whether it is in Genesis chapter 3 or it was this morning, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That story from Genesis is a special story because last week we talked about it. In verse 15, we saw the first foreshadowings of the gospel. We saw the first hints of the cross and of Christ. God said... As he speaks, this is the curse. You know, there's a curse. Adam, here's the punishment for sin. Here's what, here are the consequences of sin. Eve, here, here's the punishment. Here are the consequences. But before he spoke to both of them, he spoke to the serpent, to Satan, and said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. We call that the proto-gospel. It introduces two elements previously unknown in the Garden of Eden. And elements that become the basis of our whole Christian faith. There's a curse on mankind because of sin. And God has provided a Savior to deliver us from our sin. To take the curse of sin upon Himself. And that's what we get from Genesis 3.15. Now, today, because one of the things I want you to know, when you I challenge you, I'll read through the Bible. Read through the whole Bible, not just, oh, here's my favorite verse that always tells me I'm awesome. But, but read the whole Bible, and if you read through the Old Testament, you're going to find a lot of things that as you read it, you go, oh, wow, I see that now. That Old Testament, it's all pointing toward Jesus. Because, you know, this whole book is about Jesus. And so there are a lot of hints, and there, there are a lot of foreshadowings. There are a lot of illustrations that point toward Jesus. And I want to grab another one of those Old Testament stories today. And this, from the book of Numbers, this is one of those books, if you're reading through the Bible, you may hit the book of Numbers and you just start bogging down and you're reading through the Bible. There's some good stuff in here. Now, this is a time when the children of Israel, God's people, they've come out of Egypt, they're making their way to the promised land, and they sin against God. And there are a lot of ways they sin and they rebel against God, but this particular story If you're reading along, you can be cruising along pretty good. And you hit this one, and it's like the emergency brake gets pulled because you say, what in the world? That is one of those weird, wild stories. And we're going to try to unpack that. But, oh, it is so filled with meaning for us. And on this road to Easter, it points us in that direction. So here we go. This from Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then Numbers. Uh, The fourth book in the Bible, chapter 21. Here's what it says. Now from Mount Or, they set out by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against... You ever become impatient with God? 
And the people became impatient along the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food, there's no water, and we loathe this worthless food. We'll spend some time on that worthless food in a moment. Then the Lord sent... Wow, that's a, this is a terrible then. They did this. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many of the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, we have spoken against the Lord, against you. Pray to the Lord that he'll take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and put it on a pole, and everyone who's bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, and he set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. And then you catch the next verse. It says, and then they set out for another camp, and then they went here, and then they went there. Okay, well, that's a whole lot to throw at us just to keep on going down the road in the next verse. So we want to unpack this just a bit. The children of Israel, the Israelites coming out of Egypt, they denied God's power. They didn't believe God had the power to do what he said he could do. And what he said he could do is I can deliver you from bondage and I can can lead you to the land of promise. He said, I'll lead you. He said, I'll feed you. I'll provide for you with supernatural food. Now that that verse 5 and we loathe this worship food, worthless food. You remember what the worthless food was that is so offensive to them? Manna. Bread from heaven. Supernaturally delivered from God every morning to provide their food. So, okay, every morning you wake up and God says, I'd like to give you a miracle. Well, after a while they're saying, I am so tired of a miracle every day. What else you got? I am, we are weary of this loathsome, loathsome food. It appeared supernaturally every morning. Every morning the people would go out and they'd gather up the man. It's just like dew on the ground. It just, it's out there and they gather it up. Every day they go out. Now you couldn't, you couldn't say, well, it's Monday. I'm going to go out. I'm going to gather up manna, but I'm taking Tuesday off. So I'm going to gather up a double so I can do Monday and Tuesday. It'd go bad if you try to hold it over. Is good for a day. Except when they went out on Friday. When they went out on Friday, they, could, they needed to double up. They were commanded to double up. Get enough for Friday and Saturday because Saturday is going to be the Sabbath day. And God said, I want you to protect this day. I want you to preserve this day for me as a day of worship, as a day when you're not doing the regular stuff you do. You dedicate this day to me and you don't let everything else crowd in, crowd in and take away from it. So that day, it's going to carry over for two days. Now, This went on for 40 years. Manna is what God gave them. And uh, (laughs) manna is is another one of those pictures of Jesus. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, I'm the bread of heaven. Nehemiah pointed toward the manna, called it the bread of heaven. Then Jesus grabs that illustration in the Gospels. He says, I'm the bread of heaven. I am. I am God's special provision for you. Jesus said, you remember, I'm the bread of life. The manna was going to give them life to live day to day. The the manna that is Jesus, eternal life. Oh, this is a whole different level of things. And so, I've made this reference before. I want to hit this real quick as a sidebar to today. That when it comes to the manna, this is what I have found. So, Every day, I need to spend time in this book, and I need to spend time with my God every day. You know, what did Jesus pray in the model prayer? Give us this day, oh, daily bread. Give us this day everything we're going to need for the next hundred years. No. Give us this day what I'm going to need for the rest of the week. He said, give us this day our daily bread. I'm going to need it every day, so I'm going to have to be in this book every day, because here's the thing. My time with God, so I spent my time with God this morning early. Today's manna is not going to cover Monday for Chad's self. It's got to be an everyday thing. And you have to keep that up. It's a daily bread. So, you keep on doing this day-to-day experience. Now, that commercial for you ought to spend time with God. Now, on the other side, 
Here are these people, and now for a long time, they have been having manna every day. And I, I don't know, there are probably a lot of different ways to fix manna. You got your boiled manna and your baked manna and your uh, broiled manna and your barbecued manna and your manna kebabs. You, you do whatever you can with this bread-like sweet substance thing as it's described in the Bible different ways. Uh, end of the day, after a couple of decades, three decades, moving toward four decades, Whew, been a busy day. Honey, what's for supper? Oh, never mind. Yeah, it's going to be manna. And here's the thing. God never intended for them to have manna for 40 years. It's no wonder they got tired of it. You know what God's plan was? God's plan was, I'm going to take you out of Egypt, and I'm going to, I'm going to, there's some things I'm going to build into you related to the law, related to what I expect from you, related to what you can expect from me, this covenant relationship we're in. Uh, I'm going to... I'm going to take you from Egypt. We're going to do this little journey. And maybe it was going to be about 18 months to a couple of years. And then we're going to get to Kadesh Barnea. And when we're there, we're heading into the promised land. But see, they, they doubted God. They didn't trust God on entering the promised land. And when they didn't trust God for the promised land, man is on the diet for a whole lot longer than God intended for them. Because they're disobedient. They expect, well, you're going to go into the promised land. This land of plenty. You're going to have everything you need. You're going to live from this land and all that it produces. And instead, for 40 years, they're eating manna. One, one of the reasons it became offensive to them in some ways, probably, as sinful people, is because the manna, in all kinds of ways, for them on a daily basis, represented our sin, our disobedience, our failure before God, and every day it was a reminder to them that they didn't trust God when God says, you can trust me. There are a lot of people today who, boy, God wants to give you so much. He wants to do so much in your life. He wants to bless you, grow you. He wants you to experience the, the wonders of the Christian life. And Instead, you stopped. Instead of being on the edge of that, you stopped somewhere way back here. A lot of people do that. And they just say, well, this is good enough. And they're dissatisfied and they're frustrated. And then that's when people walk away from God. They walk away from Christian community. They, they, they give up because they didn't follow God's plan. It's not on God. It's not on Moses here. It's not on the Christian community here. It's, it's on us because we just decided we're just not going to do it God's way. Now, verse 5. It says, They spoke against God and against Moses. So God has entrusted his word to Moses. Moses is speaking God's truth to the people. He's going to lead them to the promised land. He's going to teach them what God wants them to know. But they didn't want to follow him, and they sure didn't want to follow God. And it's just an all-out sinful rebellion. So this is the consequence of sinful rebellion against God. There's a swift response from God, and it's not pretty. Verse 6, the Lord sent fiery serpents among them, and they bit the people. So that many people of Israel died. Just as, a, just as a disclaimer, there may be some passionate reptile lovers and animal rights activists among us. And I just want to tell you up front, there's no, no, there's no good snake but a dead. There's, I prefer my dead snakes. I have no toleration for this particular species. So, and I have biblical grounds for it. So only good snake, a dead snake. Now, you can imagine every morning, they're going to have to get up and they go get their manna. And they go out to get their manna. And when they go out to get the manna, fiery serpents. Oh my. And people are getting bit. And people are dying from the bites. And these snakes are everywhere. And they're coming into tents. not like you can hide from them. And now, this is one of those spots in the Bible where we back up and we go, okay, now... I'm not on board with this story, this little set of verses, because it just doesn't, it doesn't connect with my vision of who God is. See, the God I know, He fills my pockets, and He keeps me healthy, and He always does it the way I think it ought to be done, and He's going to throw it out to me and make it all good all the time. And so, 
This doesn't square with my concept of God. And that's a big part of the problem that we have in our culture, in our world, and in our spiritual lives. We've conceived of this idea of God in our mind. And this is what I think God is like. But if you really want to know what God is like, see what the Bible says. See how the Bible presents him. See how God has introduced himself to us in his word. And don't try to stick with this sappy, syrupy, sorry, sentimental. That was a lot more S's than I even thought I could pull off. Uh, that image of God. And, and try to impose that on, okay, this is who God is. Because uh, we say, well, I just can't believe that about God. So what the, here's what the Bible says about God in relationship to these people. In relationship The ones he sent the fiery servants to. He loved them. He led them. He delivered them. He provided for them. But the Bible also teaches this about the nature of God, our heavenly father, is that a fa- an earthly father says, if you don't discipline your children, you don't love your children. If you let them do whatever they want to, you don't love your children. The same thing is true with God, our father, the one whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, the Bible says. And sometimes he's going to discipline us to get us back on the right path. And things are going to come into our lives that that may hurt just a little bit. This is really a picture of Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. What comes because we're rebellion against God? Death. What comes because we, we shake a defiant fist in the face of God? Death. God hates sin. And, and what you have to understand is, and this isn't always the case, difficulty comes into our lives sometimes just because God wants to grow us. Uh, But there are plenty of biblical examples where God wants to correct us, redirect us, change us, uh, protect us from going too far in the wrong direction. So he disciplines us. And sometimes the difficulties that come into our lives are a gift of God's love. Verse 7, chapter 21. When these snakes are going through biting people, you see what they say. They get the message. Okay, never mind. We have sinned. We've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he'll take away the serpents from us. And this is the truth of God's word. And God knows our hearts. And most of us are hard-headed. Anybody want to give a testimony about the person sitting next to you? Are they hard-headed? Go ahead and raise your hand. Are they hard-headed? Oh, thank 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 you for your honesty. I appreciate that. Uh, Jimmy Smith will be available after the service to uh, pray with you and to counsel you couples because it seemed to be a couple thing that really took off in a big way. I apologize. Okay, this is the truth of God's word. We're hard-headed. And sometimes God has to send affliction into our lives to get our attention. Uh, here's a good biblical example of that from Psalm 119. The psalmist said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. I was just taken off. But then God brought some discipline. God brought some affliction into my life. And now I keep your word. God puts us back on the right path through the things that happened to us. And that's been true in my life. Well, I have seen it multiple times in multiple ways. And sometimes during those periods in my life, when I've experienced what I would consider affliction at whatever level, when I have experienced discouragement or disappointment, the tough times, those times when I had a little touch of snakes released in my life, what it does to me is it's driven me to my knees And it's driven me to look up and to trust God for everything, to seek Him with a renewed passion, with a renewed focus. And one of the reasons God sent these snakes is because He knew it would work. Many of them said, we have sinned, we admit our sin. You know, you can't sin. You can't can't say, instead of God's perfect design, I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm going to come up with my own design for how life in the world ought to work. Uh, You can't sin and escape the punishment, correction, and discipline of God because he loves us too much for that. Now, Numbers 21. I want you to see the saving remedy. And I I love what it says in verse 7. Moses prayed for the people. Isn't that awesome? Moses prayed for the people. They're being jerks to Moses too. You know, Moses, it would have been easy for him to step back and say, you got something bigger than a snake, you know, lightning bolts, whatever. Just let it rain down on these people. I'm all good with that. But instead, he really cares about them. And Moses prayed for the people. And you have people in your life. I have people in my life. And one, one of the reasons we do that 1002. 
Not time yet. 10.02, I'm praying for people that I know that they're far from God. They're struggling with sin. That they need Jesus. And they're people I know in my different circles of influence. I'm praying for them. Are you praying for people that you know? You're praying for people who really just need to know Jesus. We need to be a people of prayer. Moses models this well. Even when they were mean to him, he's still praying for God's grace and love and and help for their lives. It's a beautiful picture of praying for other people. God, they are wicked, sinful, rebellious people, but deliver them, save them, and we all ought to be doing this. Now, in verse 8, God gave them this strange remedy. The Lord said, because again, this story is so weird, the whole fiery serpent thing, and people are dying, and then God says, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make this bronze serpent. I want you to put it on the end of a tall pole. I want you to lift that up, and if people look to it, they won't die. Now, let's unpack that for just a minute. The serpent on the pole. Oh, now we're to outline so you can write stuff down. Here's the first thing. The serpent on the pole represented sin. And it was a symbolic of something very, very important for bitten people. The poison is in them without divine intervention. They're just about to die. It, why, why would God make it? Okay, here's what I want you to do. On the pole, I want you to lift up a bronze serpent. You go, oh, man, that's terrible marketing. Wouldn't it have been better if God had said, let's put a smiley face emoji up there. Something happy and positive. And we go, oh, that's cool. I like that. That's good. Uh, what about, he's the la- lamb, isn't that a sweet, a sweet biblical concept? That's a good biblical one. Let's put a, let's put a, a symbol of a lamb up there. Let's, let's put a flower on the end of the pole, something happy, something positive, something sweet. Why, why not something beautiful? Well, think about that for a minute. I want you to think about, think about how we come to this answer. From the very moment, back, back to our Genesis uh, message from last week. From the very moment Satan slithered his slimy existence in front of Eve. There's been something, there's been something sinister. Something sinful. And something scary about snakes. Do you know in the Bible... Snakes are, all, are used as a symbol, a serpent, a, a, a symbol of sin in our world, sin in our lives. And that snake was a reminder. God made it really clear. Oh, we're dying. These serpents are biting us. And okay, let's put a symbol of a serpent up here because I want to remind you, sin. This is your sin. This is your sin that's causing this. This is why you're experiencing Sin is your problem. Rebellion against God was their sin. And, and God didn't leave them wondering, oh, I wonder why all these snakes are biting us. God made it really clear, the serpent. Because of their own sin and the punishment, and even then, they probably would have started associating serpent. Oh, yeah, the, you know, they'd probably heard some of the, they'd been talking about that. Oh, yeah, here's God's, what God's been telling Moses about the Garden of Eden and what happened back there. And, Sin came and the punishment for sin against the holy God is death. Now, just as a personal admission of illness uh, is necessary before a physician can help you, you, you know, if you ever gone, I've, been, I've, I've known people who did this, sick, 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 having troubles, having troubles, and they go to the doctor and sit down. Some of you have had a spouse or friend that uh, maybe have done, have done this so, what's wrong? Ah, I'm good. And why are you here? Well, I don't want to admit it. Well, you, you're not going to get better. You're not going to get a diagnosis that's going to help you until you admit, I have an illness. I have these symptoms. I have these problems. And the same is true here. That we have to get to a spot where we admit we have sinned. And that's what these people had to do. They had to admit, God, we have sinned. And we look to the serpent on the end of that tall pole we're reminded of our sin and we're admitting to our sin here's the second thing the serpent on the pole was God's provision the people sinned against God God brought his judgment his punishment his discipline on them but he also brought the cure this is the amazing part about God he disciplines 
And he gives you the cure for the problem. In spite of all they had done, all they had failed to do, in spite of their complaining, in spite of their rebelling, God still loved his people. And he loved them too much to let them continue in this self-destructive, eternally separating direction that they were in. He wants to draw them back to himself. He's going to do something dramatic to do it. The bronze serpent could not save the people. God could save the people. God could provide the remedy. And in looking to the serpent on the pole, their eyes of faith are saying, okay, God said, if we look to this, we can be saved. It's a reminder of our sin. It's also our only hope. We look to the serpent on the pole to say, God, please, please save us. Now, the sad part about this serpent on the pole is that it, it appears another time in the Old Testament. Shows up during the reign of King Hezekiah. You know what's happening during the reign of King Hezekiah? They've, they've held on to this thing now for several generations. And people have started worshiping this thing as some sort of an idol. Because we tend to scramble a lot of stuff that's God's truth. So they're, they're worshiping these things. You know, it's not an idol that saves you. It's not a religious activity that saves us. It's God that saves us. There's only one that can rescue us. We are desperate sinners and we can't save ourselves. And the only way we're going to get any kind of saving is through a God of grace that we sang about uh, today. A God who provides a way. Third thing, the serpent on the pole was a simple solution. In other words, it's just all they needed. Verse 8, make a snake, put it on a pole. The next word, everyone who is bitten. Like that part. Everyone who is bitten. Young, old, male, female. Uh, the most religious leaning person in the camp. The biggest pagan in the bunch. Everyone. That's the, John 3.16 is the whosoever verse. It's available to everyone. Same, same solution for everybody. There's not one solution for this one. One solution for this one. God makes it really simple. God makes it clear. God makes it plain. Look at the snake and you can live. It was easy, a simple requirement. That's all God said to do. Lift it up, tell the people to look and to live. And this first requirement is so easy. He didn't say, we're going to lift up the snake. Bow down to the snake. Make a sacrifice to the snake. Bring an offering to uh, the symbol of the snake. He just said, look at the snake. And I'm sure Moses lifted up that serpent high enough on a tall enough pole that Everyone in the camp could see it. They could look at it. They could make the choice to trust God as their only hope. All they had to do was look and live. All they had to do was what God prescribed for them to do. They just had to have faith in God's plan and walk by the plan. Because there was no other plan. Now, except for that sad reference mentioned from the reign of Hezekiah, this serpent on the pole doesn't get any more press in the Old Testament. But it shows up again, one more time in the Bible. John chapter 3. And this is a weird spot for it to pop up. And it's, a, it's, it's kind of a unique application. And maybe the reason this weird little set of verses in Numbers shows up in the Old Testament is because, like a lot of things in the Bible, it's a foreshadowing, it's a pointing, it's, a, it's just a step, a, a glimpse of Christ. And... Uh, it comes in pretty good. So what's happening is there's this guy, he's a religious leader named Nicodemus, and he's intrigued by this Jesus guy. But he's not sure how it all works out. And he, he comes to Jesus. He's, he's afraid of the pressure it's going to put on him if he's, he's a follower of Jesus because his friends are going to disown him. There may be some consequences as a Jewish religious leader following, even talking to Jesus. So he, uh, he comes to Jesus under cover of night and... He starts talking to him, and early on, Jesus says, in this conversation in John chapter 3, Jesus says, you must be born again. Now, we, we use that phrasing a lot in uh, our, our Christian walk, you must be born again, which means it's a, you're all new. It's like the, the uh, 2 Corinthians 5, it's the new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. That it's all new, and so you're born again. Now, Nicodemus, he's not, he may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, as we say, because he, he doesn't think in illustrations, and he think, he's a literalist, and so you must be born again, and he goes, well, mom's still around, but I'm not sure she's going to be that keen on the idea, and okay, well, that's not what I'm talking about. Jesus is going to go through a couple of other illustrations and try to 
try to point him in the direction of what he's talking about, this new life in, in Christ. And so he's working this plan, explaining things. Moses, uh, Nicodemus is still having a little bit of a hard time, and then Jesus picks up on an illustration that he thinks Nicodemus is certainly going to be familiar with as a Bible scholar guy from Old Testament Bible scholar. He's also, uh, he's also maybe going to understand. And so in verses 14 and 15 of John chapter 3, here's what Jesus says. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him, that Son of Man is Jesus' favorite way to refer to himself in the Gospels. That the Son of Man may be lifted up. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So Jesus, he points back and he says, this whole bronze serpent story from Numbers, it's a foreshadowing of Christ. The serpent was lifted up on a pole and Jesus is going to be lifted up on a wooden cross and when you look, Old Testament, they're looking to, look to a serpent on a pole. We're looking to Jesus on a cross for the grace uh, uh, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, three things. Here's the first one. Jesus on the cross, by the way, these two sets of uh, things, you may get a hint about where I'm going with this. Jesus on the cross represented sin. Think about this. The reason, the reason that God told Moses, put a snake on a pole, is because this pole being lifted up, a symbol of the cross, Jesus being lifted up on the cross. Sometimes we want to look to Jesus on the cross and we want to adore him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We want, the, we want a, a simpler, sweeter, kinder, smiley face view of the cross. And you know, in our culture, and, and, the, and, and um, there's nothing wrong with this, that you know, you have cross jewelry, you have crosses that you hang on your wall in your home. They're all the, and I do, we do these things too because we celebrate the cross because of what Jesus did there. But the cross was a horrible thing when Jesus died on the cross. He, he, he's our Lord, He's our Savior, but sometimes we forget what transacted on the cross when the Lamb of God took the sins of the world, my sin and your sin, up on himself. That serpent on the pole was an ugly thing that reminded them of sin. For the people that watched Jesus die on the cross, the sins of the world he carried on him. And the, sin, the, the cross was a horrible, horrible thing. He took our sins upon. He bore our sins in his body on the tree, the Bible says. And the reason... The reason I think Moses made this snake, according to God's direction, is because God wanted us to see what Jesus bore. We sang this in a song just a minute ago. A lot of these songs are scripture-based songs. For our sake, this is 2 Corinthians 2, 21. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might have the righteousness of God. God transfers our sin to the sinless Son of God on the cross, that his righteousness would come back to us. That we could have the... Okay, alarm's going off. Does that mean? It's 10.02. 10.02, Luke 10.2. We're going to pray right now. Let's pray. Father, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And I pray that you send out laborers to the harvest. And God, may we be a part of a spiritual harvest God, uh, for the people that we know who don't know you, I pray you give us opportunity, maybe today, to, uh, to share the good news of Jesus with them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, this is why it's a snake. Because it's symbolic of Jesus carrying our sins. Now, Jesus on the cross is God's provision. God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us out of his boundless love. God, so aware of our sins, so aware of our rebellion, so aware of our complaining, provided a Savior. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, separated from God forever, but instead would be reconciled to God and have eternal life. Paul said it this way, for by grace 
You've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. As God provided a means whereby people bitten by poisonous snakes could be healed through faith in God's plan, He's provided the only means by which our souls, so desperately in need of healing, reconciliation, restoration, we could be healed through faith in Jesus who was lifted up on the cross. When we turn in faith to Jesus as the only one who can intercede for us before a holy God, we are redeemed from sin, we receive the gift, free gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, Jesus on the cross, third, is a simple solution. And, and don't miss this part of the gospel. It is so very simple. The requirement to become a Christian is easier than most people think. The, the, the beginning first step into the Christian life is as simple as looking to Jesus and placing our faith in Him. Do you know what? Do you know why I know it's easy to become a Christian? Because I gave my life to Christ when I was nine years old. I had an overwhelming sense of separation from God. You know, I, nine years old, I hadn't done a whole lot of big league sinning. But I'd, done, I'd sinned and I felt my separation from God because of my sin. And I had a sense of burden and conviction about it. And I couldn't fix it myself. And you know what? I put all my faith in what Jesus did at the cross. I looked to the cross. I put my faith in what Jesus did for me, dying on the cross, being raised from the dead, and I committed my life to Him, surrendered my life to Him, and I've been trying to live that life ever since then. You know what? This is why I know it's a simple solution, because at nine years old, I couldn't do many things that were hard. It was early on in, in my life, but I needed a Savior as desperately as anybody ever needed a Savior, and Jesus came into my life. It wasn't, here's why it's simple. Because I didn't do it. I can do anything complicated. It came into my life because Jesus. Jesus did all the work at the cross. He provided everything. All I have to do is accept this incredible gift by grace through faith. Now, it's easy, so easy to become a Christian. Because it's not something we do. It's something we receive. It's as easy as looking, believing, trusting, putting our faith. And it's, this is essential too. Because it's not something you can say, okay, well... Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to go through this checklist of good stuff, and I'm going to do all this good stuff. Oh, well, here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to be baptized eh, a dozen times maybe. Boy, that ought to wash something away. I'm going to, it, we'll come up with all these different, you know, it's simple because there's only one way, and it's through Jesus Christ. There's, there's, there's not a thousand ways. There's not a pick and choose. There's not uh, other options. It, God just made it simple. Look to Jesus. He's the only way. There's no other way. In Numbers 21, all they had to do is look and they could live. And it was so simple. And if they said, no, no, I'm going to, I have a snake bite kit in the tent. And I think that I'm going to be able to manage my little snake bite kit. You know, they weren't going to do so well. They were going to die. Because God said, there is one way that this is going to work. Jesus died on the cross and there's one way. For our sin to be forgiven. To know we have a relationship to God right now. Our life is full. Created for purpose. And we can know we'll spend eternity. Through Jesus Christ. And it is so simple. And so here's what we want to do. We want to do this. We want to do this when we're in this building. We want to do this when we're in our city. We just want to lift up Jesus. It's as simple as that. It's not lifting up a lot of church programs. It's not lifting up. Uh, in fact it's not even lifting up. Come to my church. It's. I'm going to lift up Jesus. That's your first step to tell people about Jesus. And we're going to continue this process we're in right now of equipping people in a simple, uh, reproducible, uh, easily transmitted way to say this is what it means to give your life to Jesus Christ. We look up. We see our helplessness to save ourselves. We put our faith in Jesus who paid for our sin at the cross. He and he alone can save. If you have never given your life to Jesus today, not jump through a bunch of hoops, not uh, checking a lot of boxes, not going to a ton of classes, just say yes to Jesus. I'm trusting what he did at the cross, and there's no other way. I believe he did it for me, and I want to, I want to put my faith in what he did at the cross, and I want to surrender my life. He's a king. He's the Lord. He's, the, he's in charge of my life from this day forward. And in that simple transaction sin is forgiven 
Jesus is a part of your life. The Holy Spirit empowers you to live this life now. And you know that one of these days, heaven is going to be your home. Uh, you know, there, there are different ways to do this. I want to encourage you today, if you, you'd like to do that, you can, there, there are a number of people in this building right now that you could talk to about it. I'll be at the Connection Center after we're dismissed. I'd like to have a chance to have a conversation with you about this. We'll have other staff members around too, other, other church leaders who can help you, encourage you in that next step. If you want to talk to somebody about it, I'd like to sit down with somebody and really break this out. Uh, those communication cards that are in the pew racks, there's a spot on there that says, I'd like to give my life to Jesus. If you would just mark that on a card and give it to me, or you can drop it in the offering plate and give us some good contact information. We'll get in touch with you today about, about giving your life to Jesus. It is so simple. It is so accessible. It is, it is so for you.